Hi, I'm Martin, and welcome to Upgrade Your Day, the podcast. But when you've got somebody who is a really good puppeteer, yeah. the, the character will be not just alive, you'll see it breathing. Yeah. And yeah. living. In the, and I, I sort of pride myself, I think. I'm an actor that became a puppeteer. I'm not a puppet maker. This character's got to live in the moment, breathe. He's got his story, where he's come from. Yeah. And, and I like to pride myself that when, when I put my character on, that they go, oh my goodness me, I become invisible yeah. and the character just becomes alive in a way that people go, oh my, it's magic. Absolutely. It makes magic. Yeah, absolutely. So I am still at the Edinburgh Fringe. We have a couple days left. That is it. We've done a whole month here and we have had the most amazing time, myself and Mike here with the Basil Brush Show for kids and then Unleash and Uncut for adults. We've had a great time, but a month somewhere, (laughs) there's a point when you really, really miss home. So we've had a great time, but I think it's time for us to get back to a little bit of normality soon. But I decided that it would be lovely to chat to my partner in crime, Mike, all about puppetry and uh, musical theatre and just ways that Mike upgrades his day with um, keeping fit and keeping his mind healthy. So we have a good old chat about a little bit of everything and how puppetry is an art form and it's a great way also to teach kids about life and about mindfulness as well, which I've, I've seen a lot of at this moment in time. So here is the lovely Mike. So I am here with the lovely Mike. Um, in the intro, I'm going to explain how long we've worked together, how long I've known you for. But we should probably start by saying we're in our little flat that's been rented by our production company here in Edinburgh, doing the Edinburgh Fringe with our Basil Brush show. Mike, tell me, first of all, how has the Fringe been for you? It's been brilliant, isn't it? It's been a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> loved every minute of it. Uh Especially since you do all the cleaning and uh, and all the cooking. And the washing. I do a lot of washing. And the cleaning. And the show, yeah. we've loved it, haven't we? We've had really nice audiences. I think what's nice doing it in Edinburgh is you get a different audience every night. And it's like running for 30 days. So you can really iron out any problems you've got in the show. And if a gag doesn't work one night, you don't panic. Because you go, well, yeah, but it worked the other night. So it's the audience's fault. It's not our fault, necessarily. So I think it's a really good ground to sort of like find out what material's working and what isn't working and maybe change it for, you know, later in the year. Yeah. But so at least you get a really good run at it. Whereas if you just do, you set a show up and you just do a couple of nights, you don't really know whether it's yeah. going to be working or not. But we pretty well know what we've got is pretty good. Ready for our international tour. Of Butlins. <laughs> yes, we'll be going to Butlins. It is international. Um, it is international. Either side of the country. We go all across the country. So. Do you know what? I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm totally with you. Um, and also being in Edinburgh, how have you found... So we do a lot of walking. We joined a gym. A, a gym. A gym. Uh, I've had a whiskey. Uh, we joined a gym so that we can just kind of like escape the fringe for a little bit. I think you have to escape the fringe. Mm. Uh, it's a little melting pot. Um, and certainly as I've got older, I sort of don't want to be around all the crowds and all the noise. Mm. I like doing the show, and then I quite like disappearing afterwards and getting out. Yeah. Maybe go and see something, but I'm quite okay with not having to be there yeah. all day and all night and how people come and do six shows mm-hmm. in one go. I don't think I could do that. And also you get a bit fed up of queuing for yeah. food. You do. And we've done a kids' show at lunchtime and then we do a grown-up show in the evening. So a lot of people don't do two shows. They do guest spots on stuff, don't they? But a lot of the time they have their days themselves, whereas we've been constantly at the theatre, really. Well, I think you can't really let yourself go until you've finished your second show. Mm. So you've always got hanging over your head, oh, I've got the show to do. So you can't go too far, you can't do too much, you can't tell yourself too much at the gym. So, I mean, I just found myself each day is I would go to the golf course in the morning, which wasn't too stressful, mm-hmm. and then perhaps go to the gym in the afternoon in between, yeah. and then ready for the evening show, and then by that time we're shattered and we just come home and have cereal <laughs> and go to bed. We're like an old married couple, we come home, <laughs> a bit of cereal, we'll have a cup of tea. You want a cup of tea? <laughs> I mean, we leave all that to the youngsters, you know, leave all that to the youngsters, because at the end of the day, we've been, well, hang on, how many years have you been in show business? When did you leave drama school? I was 22. And now I'm nearly 60. So 
it's a long time. It's nearly, I would say it's nearly 40 years. 40 years. But I remember, because we do Windsor every year, the Theatre Royal Windsor, did my very first panto at Windsor when I was 25. Yeah. And, but I do remember doing the two show days and three show days and then going out. Yeah. With the ensemble and I thought nothing of it. Getting in at one o'clock in the morning and then getting up oh. at 11 and then coming across and doing the shows again. No. But now, at this age, you do have to pace yourself. Yes. I'm looking at you as well. You're 20 years younger than me. <laughs> but one does have to pace yourself. And also, you know, there's nobody else who's going to step into our shoes. There's no understudies here. No. You've got to do the show. Yeah, yeah. And look after yourself so that you... Um, yeah, because well, also the audiences, they spent a lot of money. Mm. They save up to come to Panto. They, they have a whole day of maybe a bit of shopping, a bit of dinner. It's a whole day out for them. The last thing they want is to see you mope on and mope off because you're hungover or, or you're tired. Yeah, you, I think when you're young, you can get away with it. But yeah. I don't think you can when you're older. No. So I find if I have a late night vocally, I can't work the next day as well. Yes. And the voice, you know, because I'm a puppeteer. And voices that I do, it's not your normal voice. No. So it does get bashed. So I sort of take pride in looking after myself physically. Yeah. So I go to the gym so that, you know, this bag of sugar I hold over my head for an hour at a time doesn't <laughs> doesn't kill me. <laughs> so well, because that's in effect what it is. It's holding a bag of sugar in there and waving it around. Yeah. Um, so I take care of myself and that's, I've always been like that. Yeah. Because so, I don't think it's fair to, as you say, not be 100%. If you get ill, there's nothing you can do about it. Yes. Right, get yeah. ill. But I won't lose my voice unless it's an illness. Yes. No, exactly. And what we should do is take people back because you are a puppeteer with a, a very famous character. Um, <laughs> but you've also done other puppeteering with other characters, haven't you? Yeah. I mean, uh, in the middle of uh, puppeteering, that very famous character, which we, everybody knows, but we don't talk about because he's real. Um, he is real. Yes. I, I got to do the pajamas with the Hensons. Uh, in Belfast, I had a whole year in Belfast doing 112 episodes. Oh, that is a lot, actually. Of a preschool. But what was really wonderful was it was all singing, as well as acting, but it was major singing, great harmonies. It was ahead of its day, really, vocally. But that meant that I was able to pull on all my years as a musical theatre performer yeah. and a session singer. As a singer, that for me, that was just the gift. Yeah. To be a funny character that sang yeah. was just you know fantastic but these are different puppets the Henson puppets you're standing and they're a lot heavier so actually physically that was a killer to do that for a whole year and where was that shown was it America uh, yeah, yeah it was shown all across America and all over the world in fact it was dubbed into all different languages and it came over here but what they did over here that was very strange is they redubbed all the voices with children's voices Oh, interesting. And they didn't do all the harmonies, which I, I thought was a great pity because it lost the characterisation that we'd done and what we'd worked so hard. So I thought that was a bit strange. What was it called? The Pajanimals. The Pajanimals. You can find it on YouTube. And, right, yeah. You know, but it was, a, it was a lovely show. Every episode was 12 minutes long to help kids deal with issues of growing up, whether it be the first time going to the dentist or the first time right. going to a doctor or losing a dog for the first time. Little yeah. things that they would find and you see how... The pajamas cope yeah. with an issue. Mum and dad going away on holiday for the first time, you being left with the grandparents. Right, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. a little issue. No, I thought they were really clever. Yeah. Uh, the, of the things that we did, but it was a lot of fun. I can you know, imagine. But it was seven o'clock in the morning on set and you didn't finish till seven o'clock at night. <gasps> but did you get paid well? They looked up. <laughs> yeah. there you go. I'm sure they could have done a lot better, but you know, it, it's a different world now. I, yeah. I'm sure when our voices appeared... Um, in lots of holiday parks um, mm. with people in suits dancing to us I think that would have been nice but you know they looked after yeah, us very well exactly. I can't say they didn't and then you got to work on Dark Crystal for Netflix Dark Crystal but also uh, before Dark Crystal um, got to do um, oh god I don't think I'm trying to think what it's called right. no That Puppet Game Show the Hensons came across and there was a thing called That Puppet Game Show oh. that came across I was only sort of doing background characters and small uh, characters in that. But again, that was another Henson project. Right. And then Furchester Hotel on CBBC. I got to do some major characters in the first series of that. And that, again, was a different type of puppeting. You know, the one that I normally do, I'm lying flat on my back. Yeah. Uh, because I'm alongside humans, these were all puppets. So the set is 
four foot or five foot off the ground oh, of and you're standing full height oh yeah I forget about that That's so the first yeah. so everything's at full stretch arms high up in the air yeah and you're all working together on a screen um, and then of course came um, Dark Crystal yeah which was wonderful again they tried to get I wasn't one of the main characters in that but they had to gather every single puppeteer they knew in the country Crikey. to do the battle scenes Yes, of course. So it was a, I don't know whether you call it a posse of puppeteers or a gaggle of puppeteers, but there were many of us. Yeah. And you didn't just have the puppeteers, you had the people doing the radio controlled eyes. Oh, yeah. And all the expressions. <sighs> and that's so you, choreography, that is. Yeah, so you have to choreograph that yeah. with that person who's supporting you. Um, and then you'd have these battle scenes. But again, these were huge puppets, very, very heavy yeah. puppets. Some of them were the originals from the original Dark Crystal as well. So that was lovely because again, that was a whole. But again, you're on the set at seven o'clock in the morning, yeah. and you walk off at seven o'clock at night. These are people don't realise when you're filming stuff. Mm. Now, very long filming days, yeah. And people always think that they can, they can do puppetry in the sense of, oh yeah, you're just doing a bit of this, you're doing a bit of that. But as we've known over the years of working together, it's quite an art form. <laughs> it's a real art form, and even the most the obvious mistakes people make where. What they when they talk as a puppet, they'll close, close their the hand as if it's speaking, but actually you have to open it, and that feels very unnatural to open your hand when you're speaking. And instantly, I mean, even I'm doing it now with my hands, my muscles in my hands are aching. So imagine yeah. what it must and be like doing a day on set. As well, yeah. And then you've got to focus what you're looking at. When, yeah. When you, you'll notice when somebody's not a puppet, you go, "Oh, it doesn't really look alive." But when you've got somebody who is a really good puppeteer, yeah, the the character will be not just alive. You'll see it breathing yeah and yeah. living in and I, I sort of pride myself I think I'm an actor that became a puppeteer I'm not a puppet maker mm. who often becomes puppeteers or perhaps people who do voices and mm -hmm. um, become a puppeteer or event yeah um, I feel as I approach my characters it's as an actor yeah yeah so this character's got to live in the moment breathe he's got his story where he's come from yeah and and I like to pride myself that when when I put my character on that they go oh my goodness me I become invisible yeah. and the character just becomes alive in a way that people go oh my it's magic absolutely it makes magic yeah exactly. absolutely and as we've seen with um, our show the kids just they buy it they completely absolutely buy it because you make things come alive well come alive <laughs> come alive don't we have to pay the rights for oh, that yeah, so, uh, <laughs> but I think uh, what's interesting about that is that you know you get a puppet on stage and it comes alive for the kids they enter the magic because we let them I yeah. think sometimes we, the kids are, they grow up too quickly yeah. you know I've got a family yeah. and I think they get on these computers and they're quite violent and the entertainment's done for them but I think what's great sometimes when we do let them be kids at Pantos mm. they're, they're suddenly kids again Yeah, and they yeah. realise they've got an imagination that works and it comes alive and, and you know we need to keep doing that I yeah. think and let the kids be kids yeah. for a little bit longer than they, they are really they grow up far too quickly and what we should say is you as you mentioned you started off as an actor but you are an old West End Wendy really I'm aren't you I'm an old loving <laughs> <laughs> through and through what shows were you doing in the West End when you started do you remember like touring West End just... uh, it started with rep right and really I started as a rep actor doing Stephen Sondheim musicals yeah everything I wanted to do was do Stephen Sondheim because I was quite musical I was grade 8 on the piano session singer all that so I wanted to be tested musically and that Stephen Sondheim was the best so you know I got to play Jack in Into the Woods and Tobias in Sweeney Todd these were major mm. achievements mm. but what I did find with me vocally is that I was a big singer but I didn't look necessarily how I sang right I could. I did a lot of singing on Radio Two Friday night's music night, and when I would sing Marius Empty Chairs, but I would never get cast as Marius. Right. Yeah. Of course. I don't yeah. look the part, but I could sing it. Yeah. I could sing easily. I could sing Phantom. You know, all I ask of you. And in fact, I used to sing that a little bit in the music of Andrew Lloyd Webber in concert, but I would never get cast as that. You know, I'm five foot four. Um, I look more like a cat, so I had to adapt myself to be more a character actor. Mm and do comedy because that's what I look like as opposed to physically <laughs> you know I think I'm terribly handsome but I'm not a six foot strapping you know male lead yeah, yet I could it. sing like well the Phantom that. has a look as well doesn't he Phantom has this kind of like debonair kind of James Bondy look yeah. I guess 
So I'd never, you know, I'd never play those characters. So yeah. I had to be aware of what my limitations were. Mm. So, you know, I'd play Puck in Sweeney Todd. And then uh, in the West End, I got into Children of Eden. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I was kind of the characters, yet the good-looking male leads, you know, I was never going to get. Um, yeah. And we did um, uh, Sherlock Holmes and played one of the Irregulars, you know, just one of the lads, Jack the Lad. So that was me, really. And, you know, for me, I was quite disappointed that I could never get to play those lead roles because I could sing them. Right, yeah. But I, but I got to sing them on radio and in sessions. So I did sort of get to do them. And did you do booth singing for Starlight Express? Did I just make that yeah, up? Yeah, I used to yeah. Starlight. Um, yeah. Also Cats and uh, Starlight Express, Cats, Grease. Grease. And Saturday Night Fever. They all had vocal booths. So these were a time when the digital technology wasn't there. Yeah. Where you would have multi layers and the people on stage were doing such choreography they couldn't mic them all or sing. You'd have brilliant dancers who couldn't necessarily sing. Yeah. So they'd have boothers, booth singers. Now, cats always had four singers in the booth just to thicken up the harmonies. Yeah. There were eight in Greece. Crikey. When that was in the West End. And that was brilliant yeah. for us because, and I was adept in all of those because I could, I could sing tenor line or baritone. So there were regulars who did it all the time. But then I would go and do my rep theatre or go away and, do, and come back and I'd go on the debt list. Right. So if somebody was sick or they had a better paying singing job, yeah. I would go in. So I used to go in quite often, was very busy. And now, of course, that's all just recorded. It's just press well, play button. It was a it was a real thing when they decided that they wanted to change the Grease vocal booth to a tape. Yeah. And of course people were invited to be the recorders. Ah. And you just knew that you're doing yourself out of a job. Yeah. In the end. Of course. And it goes on tour and it's it's all on tape now. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But but the funny thing was when I was in the vocal booth of um Cats, and I did that probably for about ten years, was that my wife, current wife was was in it as White Cat. Of course. At the time. Didn't yeah. know. So I'd probably be sitting alongside her. Oh my gosh. And didn't know because they were all in makeup. We used to come into the green room of Cats <sighs> at the, the old New London Theatre and the boothers would come and arrive at five minutes to go. They were all stretching and we'd sit there and in we'd go to sing Jellicle Ball in a little booth doing oh, a crossword or, or we'd play Scrabble. Yeah. But then we were finished before the end of the first half and we'd go to the pub or the cafe. <laughs> How funny. So you probably met Nicola. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Many, many times. And have you done any cast recordings for anything? Um, I did Children of Eden. Yeah. Was a cast recording. Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Because I only really did those two West End shows. Nicola, right. my wife, she's, she'd been in everything. Oh, she's done them all, hasn't she? She's been in literally... There's, there's not one she had done. I don't think there is one. <laughs> and, you know, original cast as well, you know. So she, so down our hallway, it's all Nicola's yeah. stuff, but it's not mine. Whereas I was doing, like, playing Puck in A Midsummer Night's yeah, Dream yeah. In, in the provinces. You know, playing. I was playing leads in provinces and she was in the chorus in the West End. Yeah, right, nice. You know, so I was very happy in provinces. I, it was good. You know, I quite like getting away and going to a new town. And, but at that time, you see, I know this is what you want to get onto eventually, was I was a runner. Hmm. Oh, so well, yeah, whatever yeah. town I went to, I took my running with me. Yes. And I would join the local athletic club and do races. And I can remember playing um, in Sweeney Todd, playing Tobias at the Salisbury Playhouse. Hmm. And then every Sunday I would find a race that was on somewhere and race it and I'd yeah. get to know the local athletic club they would say oh there's a race such a play and I'd go and do that so I was able to take that with me to every town yeah. explore the town and run you know 10 miles and so again when you were on tour you basically that was your little sort of side hustle really it was something to do something something like to... A, that was my consistent thing yeah. that I did all the time so if I was right. out of work yeah. I would train harder yeah and be running 10 miles a day yes because I was doing marathons yeah. so I'd do that and then when I'd go to a show I'd probably find a show I'd run into the theatre yeah and people would say oh look how fit he is you know and even if there was dancing in the West End when I was in Children of Eden I used to run in from my flat in Wilston Green it was six miles in do the show and run six miles out crikey 
But I think it's also important when you're doing in this business that when work comes to an end, that's what a lot of people suffer from, is it all just stops. Whatever it is, the social life, the people, the job. And so I think it's always important to have something else that runs alongside of it that you can keep up. Well, you live for show business. Every, you know, it's like in Panto. Yeah. The whole of life stops. Yeah. For that eight weeks. <laughs> yes, that life does. Life goes on yeah. hold. Yeah. So for me, what I would do is if I took my running with me, it was there with me when I went, it's like I'm a teddy bear. Yeah, it is. It I'd is. go away, but I'd have my shorts and I'd go, oh, I'm going for a run today. The show's opened, yeah. you know, and I'd go, I'm going to find a really nice place to run yeah. up a hill. You know, when I did Perth Rep, I'd got Kinool Hill yeah. every day up Kinool Hill, super fit. Yeah. And then do the boyfriend at night. You know, so there I'm playing Bobby doing all this never out of breath yeah. because I was so fit well last year or the year before Debbie McGee used to go walking with Debbie McGee Debbie up the long McGee. walk yeah. well you see that's a sign of age now see? <laughs> I was running before and now I'm you're wandering <laughs> with Debbie McGee in between the shows to get you out of the theatre because yeah. it again a bit like Edinburgh here mm. you have to get out you have to escape yeah. because show business is one of these things the highs are so high mm normal life actually feels like a low yeah because you get this adoration get rounds of applause people think you're brilliant and you get that run of adrenaline and the buzz yeah. it's like a drug yeah yeah drug every day you know. to, when we finish pan, <laughs> when we finish panto um if i'm because i feel a bit down in the dumps because you get the blues don't you for a little mm. bit Bruce will say to me, go on up the stairs then. And then I walk down the stairs as if it's the walk down of Panto. And he'll just clap it. Yeah. yeah. Hey, and I'll take you. a bow. Then I'll gesture for the princess to walk down. You see, I mean, you live Panto. <laughs> you live Panto. Like literally he's just sat there going, yay, with the dogs. And I'm like, thank you, thank you. And he's like, how long do we have to do this for? And I'm like, just a couple of days and I'll be over it. It's fine. But, I, but I think what people don't realise is when you're away from home and you're on a tour, like you're in a rep, you're just in a little hotel room or in some digs yeah. on your own. So everybody gives you this big round of applause. They think you're fantastic. Then, then you're on your own Yeah, yeah. for the whole day. Or like us in a travel lodge. I mean, we did a tour two years ago for about three weeks and we're doing two shows a day back to our travel lodge in the evening. Well, I mean, I had the little camp bed. <laughs> you took you the main bed. A camp bed. <laughs> a camp bed, yeah. <laughs> I had this little tiny bed on these little legs, and you're in this big place. Just, oh, I was very kind. I let you have the bigger bed because yeah. you're billing. Yeah, but because because <laughs> you're billing. billing, you deserve the bigger bed. Um, but but again, you know, we have that big old day, and then suddenly there we are, crapped in this little room with the little headphones on. With well, the little headphones on, catching up on the news or whatever it is, you know. I know, but imagine if you haven't got people like you're married to Bruce, I've got Nicola. Mm. If you haven't got that person to keep you grounded, on, you know, it could be quite a lonely. Well, my Bruce definitely keeps me grounded. <laughs> Let's just say oh, that. Just say you're grounded. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I think, um, obviously, what that grade or day is all about with regards to positivity and um, mental health and, and mindfulness, if your job, especially in Panto or whatever, is all consuming, you have to have something else to take your mind. To well, place. I think what's interesting about what we do for a job, you see, mm. we we do for a job what for a lot of people is their hobby. Yeah. So you get a lot of hand drums. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. They love it. Yeah, and that is their release yeah. from their humdrum day to day going into the office nine to five. Oh, nine to excuse five. me. That oh, one. that'll be agent. the agent. It'll be an agent. It's my agent. He's gonna, if he gets a booking, I've got a booking wife, as well. This is my wife. I'm just doing. Oh, we've got Nicola on now. Hello, Nicola. Oh. oh. <laughs> Obviously not connecting. Where's she go? Why is it not connecting? Oh, I don't know, we have funny issues in Edinburgh with signal. I think yeah. it's sometimes on a Saturday when it's, <laughs> it's full of people. people. <laughs> there's so many people here. Too many that, people. There's, I mean, I should say there's 3,800 shows here. There's 300 odd venues. There are thousands and thousands of people in Edinburgh. So poor old Nicola yeah. can't even so get she's through. Got to go. So anyway, where I was was saying, yeah. people do what we do mm. for a hobby, mm. but we do it for a job. Mm. and it's an all-encompassing job mm. so actually you do need to get a release from your job so what is our release well it's not doing drama yeah for me it's always been sport yeah so i focus on the sport and i, I would comp- keep that going all through even when i'm working yeah trying to keep my sport going yes it was running I, i've now gone into golf and there's a lot of actors that play golf yeah the stage and television golf society that i'm um, treasurer of and going to be captain of next exactly. year but it's all lots of actors and it's amazing how many out of work actors play golf mm. and the stage golf society was created 
um, over 100 years ago by just trying to keep his actors out of the pub. Oh, nice. To make right, them more yeah. fit. Yeah. Because they used to be in the West End and they do the shows, they go and pick the mail up in the morning and then they just go to the pub and turn up, you know, half <laughs> yes. cut yes. for the shows. So he said he had to find them something to do. So he created this stage golfing society. Oh, wow. And that's why it was created. Wow. To give, you know, do something with your time yeah. when you're away from home. Yeah. yeah. And it was all over the country, you know, people were doing this all over the country. Wow. So for me, that's what I do when, you know, it's, for you it would be like a good walk spoiled having to hit a ball. But for me, <laughs> it's a reason to do my walking. <laughs> I couldn't just do the walk that you do now like you used to do my... Yeah. The running was, I trained so I could win a race. And the golf is, I like the competition. It's a real focus. But I'm very good at. I like the walking bit, but also I like the practicing bit of just putting the ball into a hole for hours. Yeah, it's just brain deadening, and it's a way. And like here, I joined Prestonfield Golf Club. Yes, I've been up there yeah. today for a lesson. Yeah, I haven't played the course much because we haven't had time. But I've gone up there and had food, been yeah. on the putting green, yeah, chatting to the locals. And, and it's a great way to look after your mental health to get yeah, out I get and out. do something totally different. Yeah, it's completely different. And then when we enter, we go back into them and go, right, here we go, big yeah. breath. Yeah. You know, I mean, a lot of the comedians this year are talking about their mental health as comics. You yes. Know? Yeah. So for me, it's a physical release. Yeah. I can't just sit still and perhaps meditate. That, yeah. that would drive me up the wall. Yeah. I have to physically do something. Do something, yeah. And I think it's also important to remember that when we have that little breakaway and we do something else like you say it takes your mind somewhere it breaks away from what your job is mm. and I get a lot of friends saying to me oh how can you go home after a show and eat cereal and drink drink tea with Mike when yeah. actually uh, you should be out celebrating I'm like, but it's my job that's the difference that's it I'm yeah. doing it as a job and I need to break away from it I can't be out swanning around and I'm not very sociable nowadays I have to admit I don't know what's happened but no, it's age honestly you know I you just go I, d- I don't really want to speak to other comics or performers I just want to go home I just want to break away from it mm. you know yeah, it's well, it's like most people want to break you know if they're in the office they just want to go home exactly so it is yeah. like being in an office but yeah. it's a treat because I've got to say I've not really done a day's work in my life I was an accountant <laughs> you still haven't Mike I'm a qualified accountant <laughs> yeah but so I had to get out of the office I couldn't bear but I felt trapped mm. in an office it, and I was doing amateur dramatics on the outside of that yeah. But I wanted to do more dramatics and you know, take it further. Yeah. But I couldn't have continued doing amateur dramatics because being in an office would have finished me off. Yes, I, I, It was like I was trapped. I need to expend energy. Yeah. So for me, getting a job as an actor and going to drama school and then I've been doing it for 40 years, I haven't really done a day's work in my life. <laughs> But I've worked very hard at <laughs> yes. what I've done. Yes, exactly. So for someone like yourself, with everything that you do, obviously um, puppeteering and acting and singing, and then you have your golf and golf. your sport. Um, for somebody that is, say, maybe anxious or wants to try and find a way to upgrade their day, would you recommend getting on a golf course? <laughs> <laughs> now, what I'm recommend. Golf is one of these... You see, golf is a very, very frustrating game. Mm. The trouble with me is I have to do something to my best ability. Mm. So I couldn't just go on a golf course and hack it round and enjoy it. I have to do my best on that. That's sort of my challenge, really. So I would say go to a driving range and hit the living daylight. If you've never hit a golf ball before... What's wonderful about golf is it you have to be totally focused on it completely. You can forget about everything around you, otherwise it just doesn't work. You've got to be completely encompassed in trying to hit this little ball with a stick mm-hmm. down the course. If you have any distractions or anything, it won't work. Yeah. So in that respect, I think it's a great thing for somebody. You get exercise, you get a handicap, so you can have a little competition, get, and it's very social. Yeah. If you're a person that gets very frustrated because things don't come easily, you'll end up snapping the clubs and chucking them in water. That'll be me then. That'll you know, be me. Chucking myself in water, probably. Because it can be extremely frustrating. But there are other things. You can go to the, the putting ranges that they've got, you know, yeah. dinosaur putting and fun putting, and they're bringing new types of golf out in, with screens and stuff like that so you can have a swing. So it would be... I mean, the easiest thing is go for a walk because the walking part is part of golf. I would recommend if you are interested in sport and interested in golf and having a go, once you've done it, you'll never go back. 
Would you recommend Crazy Golf? Yes. <laughs> oh, God, it's hilarious. I love it. That's how we started my Nathan. Crazy Golf in Cleethorpes. Oh, my God. I think I've been there. Because you can do it all the time. And they've got foot golf as well, which is a bit of fun as well. They keep trying this. It is technically a very difficult game to play. Mm. Nathan's been playing since he was two. It's effortless for him. Yeah. It's a game, funnily enough, that when people take up when they're older, they all say they wish they'd taken it up when they were younger. Ah. And they all go, God, I wish I'd taken golf up. Because I found with running, I was quite a fast runner. I didn't have many people I could run with. Mm. But with golf, you've all got a handicap. Very social. I was never a sociable person Mm. with my sport. Mm. But I am with golf. I love nothing more than playing around with four people I've never met before but I think when you go past um, golf courses and as we know when we've done our tours you've always found a golf course somewhere you can sniff a golf course out like there's no tomorrow I've always found though when you see golfers they do look like they are properly escaping whatever it is whatever their job is whatever their life is Mm. that whatever what if they might have their own anxiety and whatever it might be you can tell that they are taking some time out they're taking a breath and this is just their time to they chill. Love it. And also, you know, I just went and played St Andrews. So you play different courses that look beautiful with a great vista. It's a new place yeah. to go. And you go, what a beautiful hole. And, yeah. you know, you do, you, it becomes all encompassing. Mm. As much as showbiz is, yes. it can take you over because you decide to go, oh, I want to get to be a better golfer. Mm. So it does take up quite a lot of time, but it's something you want to focus on. It comes back to balance, doesn't it? Balance. Balancing everything out. Listen, that's why the Stage Golf Society was invented to keep the, the golfers, at, the actors out the pub. Yeah. So they all got tuition and they started teaching them golf. But now you get club rooms where after golf, everyone just goes and gets drunk anyway. <laughs> they're doing this stuff. But actually, now again, that's going by the wayside. They're all turning into people like me. I just drink tea. Drink um, tea total. Tea, coffee, and some avocado tea, on top. Yeah, the lime and soda <laughs> to get older. But it's got a great social side. Nicholas says to me, she said, although my golf club is quite expensive, she said it's far cheaper than, you know, going to therapy or something like that. Mm. I actually find that's my therapy. Yeah. If I've had a really tough day, yeah. she'll say, oh, just go over the golf course and play a few holes. Yeah. And you know what? But I come back and I feel so much better. Exactly. Whereas I used to go running. I'd have a long day and I'd come back and I'd put my shorts on. That was the cheapest way to do it. I just yeah. went and go a bit of running, but now I can't do that. But you're investing in your well-being. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Which is really important. I always have done. Yeah. And if you can afford it, then that is a great thing to invest in. Yeah. And it's important to remember that. And I think a lot of people forget, sometimes you go and buy your £4.70 coffee and think nothing of it, some people. And actually, all those little coffees a week, yeah, well, it can see, add I up to go without those a, a golf make... membership. Yeah, well, yeah, my golf membership is my mental health. And of course, what has it given us as well? Where, where do we rehearse? At a golf club. At my golf club. Exactly. And where's the opening sequence of our show? It's at the golf club. Filmed at a golf club. Filmed at a golf club. <laughs> and there we all have lunch. And when anybody... You're making me want to do golf now, Mike. And so just, just finishing up then, just going back to puppetry, which we started right. yes, with. Yes, of course, we started with puppetry. I think um, when I've taught mindfulness to kids, sometimes it's quite hard to get them to understand a lot of what you talk about, which is very like the science behind it. And I've always found, and I think it's quite a lot online as well, you can sort of Google it, Puppets are a great a great way to educate kids. I think it's a great way to kind of connect with them and have a bit of fun as well. So even like a sock puppet and a couple of little eyes. Well, I you think know. the interesting thing about a puppet is if you're trying to say something to a kid, it, as far as they're concerned, it's a grown-up. Mm. And they don't like that. Yeah. It's like a teacher. Yeah. But when they look at the puppet, even though it's attached to your arm, somehow they focus on the puppet tone. I used to put Nathan to bed with the puppet now if I said to him you've got to go to bed he didn't want to go to bed but when I said the puppet saying oh let's have a race to bed yeah he thought it was the best thing since sliced bread yeah and they're going oh I've closed my eyes so they do focus on the puppet more than on a human being and I know many occasions I've gone into hospitals and done things with with a variety of puppets yeah and you find that kids who have got learning difficulties in fact don't you remember when we were first here in 2019 at the children's show, a mother and their daughter came to every single children's show. Yes. Because she only spoke to puppets. That's right. And she smiled and she said, I've never seen my daughter smile yeah. so much. And we met her after the show. Every single show. Yes. We had a chat. And that yeah. girl talked yeah. as if there was no problem at all. Yeah. Yeah. 
And yet, away from that, her, her mother said she doesn't talk. Yeah, that's true. Except to puppets. Yeah. So there is something in, you know, particularly with children with learning difficulties, I've found, engage totally with the poet. We have a number of people who come and visit us in Panto yeah. with learning difficulties and they come backstage and they meet Basil. Yeah. And they are just absolutely totally, yeah. and I think it's a way of breaking down barriers and they speak to the puppet in a way that I, I suppose they can't communicate with a human. Yeah. Especially think, grown ups. I think you can definitely up. Can you upgrade your day with puppets? Yes. Yes, you yes. certainly can. It is such a lovely thing to do. And people tend to forget about it as well. They forget about that as an art form. So I think that's why it's wonderful. And our shows, as you obviously know, have been going down very well. The kids show, mm. the grown up show we do in the evening. We've got a show tonight at 6 30, up an ultimate one. So um, it's been going very well. And I think it doesn't matter what age you are. As we know, we have people in our audience from, from the kids show, though. they're like two right through to 82 92 whatever it is and people just love it don't yeah, they yeah well they they always want to be kids I think even though we're older our brains are still younger in our minds so physically yeah you know approaching 60 yeah. my mind is still saying I'm 25 and and I think it just allows them to be kids again yeah. for a short time you just go oh this is just simply fun yeah joyous we're not trying to be outrageous or make a statement, a political yeah. statement with jokes. Or, you know, there's a lot going on nowadays of, of what you can and can't say. We have a show that's just joyous. Joyous, unadulterated. That's it. Fun. And there's a market for that. And we make no apology for that's what we are. No. Do you remember a review once said, oh, it's end of peer. And we're like, well, that was, well, <laughs> that, was part, that was part of the idea. No, it didn't really. <laughs> and yet... That's the reviewer. Yes. But when we speak to the audience after, they just say... They're loving the, it. The best We thing, love that, yeah. That's just what we... We don't get enough of this. Exactly. There's a market like for Tim everyone. Vine. We went to Tim Vine. Yeah. His type of joke, really. Yeah. It's old-fashioned type of play on words. Yes. Yeah. You know, when he holds up a sign and he hands it to you and says, oh, that thought. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's just brilliant yeah but most comedians nowadays wouldn't you know no. they're making political no. statements and yeah there's a market for everyone and we yeah. have to remember that um, and I think sometimes there are quite a few viewers <laughs> reviewers that need to kind of remember that Re a little yeah, bit I, as well well, okay, well they're trying to make themselves clever and say uh, we're, yeah. we're above all of this it's like I, I've said it before about Mrs Brown's boys you know what whatever you think about that show Whatever you think, there is a market for that audience. Yeah. And you know what? The Christmas special still gets watched by millions and millions of people. They still tour arenas. It, they tour mm. arenas. It might not be your cup of tea. It might be old fashioned. It might be this. It might be that. But there is a market for it. And you can't leave that market out. You know, you but, can't do that. But also what people say, oh, don't, don't people find your jokes old fashioned? And you go, you've got to remember kids, right? Yeah. Growing up, they begin to understand language mm. for the first time. So when they understand that a, a word might have two meanings, mm. and it's that's what makes it funny. Yeah. So of course you throw that back into them. So it's a new audience every year. Exactly. So we go back and say, yes. you just have to reinvent the show. Same I jokes. would say you don't have to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> yes. Because yeah. we've got a new audience coming through every year yeah. who suddenly understand language or a funny poem. So we throw it at them, and they yeah. love it. Yeah. So there's no no point in changing it because. Yeah. Th that's what they understand well if people are coming and people are investing and spending their money yeah. on tickets and they're doing it then why yeah. not the moment nobody shows up and we're performing then to we, ourselves then that's then we different know. but you know what we're having a cracking time we are loving it upgrade your day with puppetry that's what I say and come and see a Basil Brush show because I hear Basil is very talented he's a very talented <laughs> person uh, uh, character <laughs> yeah. on that note Thank you very much. Let's go and do our penultimate show, shall we? Before I want tea first. You're making a cup oh, of tea. Go. We'll have a cup of tea and a bowl of cereal. Of <laughs> That's where we've got to. So that was the lovely Mike. I hope you enjoyed listening to that episode. We, as I've said earlier on, we've had an absolute hoot here, but it is now time to get to our penultimate show and our final show tomorrow and get back to a bit of normality. So um, as always, if you want to send me any messages, send it to Martin, M-A-R-T-I-N, at upgradeyourday.co.uk. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at Upgrade Your Day. I think Facebook is Upgrade Your Day page. And um, 
and the website upgradeyourday.co.uk. You can message me through there as well. See what's going on. I've got bits and bobs here, there and everywhere. Thank you so much for listening. And if you want to leave a star rating or a little review, please do. It's completely up to you, but I'd really appreciate it if you've enjoyed listening to these. Thank you so much and um, have a great day, everyone. (music) 